Hey, I'm Mr. Mickens, and today we're going to do some advanced physics. Ooh, it's really not. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about how things move in one dimension, meaning just left to right, just up and down on one axis. But we know objects have the ability to move in two dimensions, moving on two axes at once, like this. If objects are moving in two dimensions, that means that the quantities that we've been analyzing can now be split into two dimensions as well. We will have velocity on the x-axis and y-axis. Sometimes we refer to that as the horizontal or vertical velocity. We also have two displacements. An object can be displaced horizontally and vertically at the same time. However, with acceleration, there's something a little tricky going on here. Objects don't accelerate on the x-axis as they fly through the air, ignoring the air resistance that is actually everywhere. It takes a force to change the velocity of an object. So if there are no forces, the acceleration on the x-axis is always zero. However, there is a very special force that I'm sure you're aware of that is affecting the object's motion as it flies through the air. It's called gravity. And on Earth, it accelerates all objects downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. We call all objects subject to these conditions projectiles. And we can use projectile motion to solve a variety of things. In physics, we love to discuss cannons shooting objects off of cliffs to nowhere for no reason at all. So today I'm trying to figure out exactly how far do I need this bin to be placed in order for it to catch this ball. Why do I want to figure that out? Don't worry about it, mind your business. I'm a physicist, we do what we want to do. Now, if you were with me when we solved one dimensional kinematic equations, this is going to be very similar, but a little bit more complicated, but also easier, but harder. But since we're in two dimensions, that means we have two sets of symbols for our x-axis, for our y-axis. Now we're gonna do what we always do. We're going to pull out our givens and plug them in the correct spot. This ball is rolling on the table at 3.3 .3 meters per second. Look at this ball. Is it moving on both axes right at the beginning? No, it's just moving horizontally right upon launch. So therefore, all 3.3 meters per second of that velocity is horizontal. Is it moving vertically at all right upon launch? No. We can assume that the initial velocity on the y-axis is zero. Let's see what else I can figure out. I can get a meter stick and measure how high up the ball is from the ground. It's 0.3 meters high. But think about it. This ball is going to fall downwards. So therefore, its displacement on the y-axis will be negative 0.3 meters. What else can we get? We know on the y-axis, gravity is accelerating all objects downward at negative 9.8 meters per second squared. On the x-axis, there are no forces causing the velocity to change, which means if there's no change in velocity on the x-axis, acceleration is zero. And if acceleration is zero, that means the final velocity on the x-axis has to be the same as the initial velocity if it's not changing. Here we are. We're trying to figure out how far I need to place this bin for it to catch the ball. That means we're really looking for its change in position on the x-axis, delta x. I'm going to jump ahead very quickly. Since we're traveling in two dimensions, we also have two sets of kinematic equations to choose from. We only have one equation that deals with delta x. It's my favorite. It's easy. However, we don't have the time that it's flying through the air. 
So believe it or not, we're going to have to determine how long it was flying through the air before we can figure out how far it went. And that makes a lot of sense. So let's solve for time first. And now we only have the final velocity on the y-axis remaining. Do you remember what to do? It's not used. Therefore, let's pick an equation that does not have v of y in it. Which one do you see? Ah, my favorite one. Huh. This should be negative 0.3 is equal to zero times t plus one half of negative 9.8 times t squared. Let's just do the basic math. Zero times anything is zero. Zero plus anything is anything. Half of negative 9.8 is negative 4.9. We want to get t squared by itself. It's being multiplied by negative 4.9. So how do we get rid of negative 4.9? Divide on both sides by negative 4.9. Negative 0.3 divided by negative 4.9 is equal to 0 0.06. That's t squared. Who cares about t squared? You need to, leave. to get t, we need to do the opposite of squaring a number. Oh, goodness. Thank you. You didn't say divide by 2. We're going to take the square root of that. The square root of 0 0.06 is 0.25. It'll take 0.25 seconds for this ball to land. Now that we know the time, we can plug it into my favorite kinematic equation for projectile motion. Delta x is equal to the initial velocity on the x-axis times time. Do we have the things that we need? Absolutely. Do we have to do any algebra? Nope, let's do it. Delta x is equal to 3.3 times 0.25. And this will tell me how far I need to place this bin. Based on the conditions of projectile motion, we're able to predict where I can place this bin. And it's telling me I can place it 0.83 meters away from the table. Let's see. Closer. This is still science. We need repetition. We need some revisions. We need to revisit our procedure. We need to take into account possible errors made. We need to take into account the conditions of projectile motion. And there are some things I've talked about that are actually ignored in these calculations, right? Try this on your own. Because for engineers, architects, these calculations are very important for determining where things need to be placed how far things will be moving, where certain targets need to be placed. And honestly, if we could get rid of air resistance, you'd be the perfect basketball player, wouldn't you? All thanks to physics. Thanks for watching.